Okay, so I'll, I'll get started maybe just by introducing myself. Um, some of you might have seen me yesterday in the previous um, session on open access publishing. Um, my name is Didi, I'm a science librarian here at the university and I also cover um, an area we call scholarly communication, which is kind of library jargon. I'm not sure that any other discipline uses that term, um, but it just means I'm interested in supporting researchers, scholars, in uh, communicating about their research, basically, and all the different issues and topics involved in that. So that's why I spoke about open access publishing yesterday and this topic today. Um, so that term, scholarly communication, is a really big umbrella term that covers lots of different things. And so that's my, um, my kind of professional interest, but also my research interest. Uh, so something you may not be aware of is that librarians are also faculty here at the university, and so we have our own research programs as well. So I'm a researcher and author as well. So these are topics that I deal with as an author as well. So um, not just as a professional librarian, but also as a researcher myself. So that's the angle that I come at this in, but um, thinking about the quality of information is a particular concern for librarians. So that's also the, the sort of angle I come from and sort of the expertise I bring to this. Okay, um, so feel free to type uh, comments or questions in the chat at any time. I'll, I'll keep glancing over there. And let me just put, I see more people have joined, so I'm just going to put the slides in the chat one more time. Okay, and we'll get going. So there's, again, the link to the slides, and I know you can't click on it through there, but that's why I've put it in the chat. Um, and the outline to the session is really simple. Basically, I want to introduce the problem give some definitions and context and some nuances, because I think before we get into the practical, like I think most of you are here to learn some assessment criteria to avoid some of these um, predatory journals. Uh, thank you for filling out that pre-assessment um, survey. So that, that really confirmed to me that that's what you're here for. But I think before we get into that, it's useful to understand sort of the context that this problem has developed in and sort of what are the the nuances? Um, because that will help you a lot when you go to do your assessment, I think. Okay, so those are the two main um, divisions, I guess, to this to this session. So let's get into the problem of this topic right now. So this is the definition we came up with for our library guide on this topic. So there's a link to um, the guide there at the bottom. So basically, what we're calling predatory publishers are using deceptive practices. So that's the key term here, deceptive. They're trying to deceive authors to publish with them. Um, so they're, they're using misleading um, things, many ways that we'll get into in the criteria. Um, and basically they're doing this because there exists now um, an open access author pays business model. You've probably encountered that before. This is a legitimate business model for funding open access journals. Um, they're called APCs or article processing charges. And you know, wherever there's a way on the internet to exploit um, people, People, other people will try and do that. So that's basically what's going on here. Um, these entities are exploiting the, the author, author pays model of open access for their own profit. Uh, they may be promising some services like peer review or editorial work, but there is little evidence that they do any of that. They're simply there to collect your money essentially, right? So you wanna avoid these, these things. So they're internet scams, basically. They're, they're not legitimate publishers. Um, you might have seen the those scare quotes I put around the predatory, and that's because um, a lot of librarians actually don't like that term predatory to describe these things. Because if we're talking about predatory regarding money, um, a lot of profit-driven publishers can also be argued to be predatory in their pricing. Uh, it's not well known maybe to those outside of libraries that uh, there's a lot of profiteering going on in legitimate conventional sort of profit-driven publishing. So we kind of <laughs> we kind of get a little fussy about the term predatory for that reason. Um, 
But now I think authors are beginning to see this too because of this uh, trend towards open access and these legitimate publishers are trying to switch their business or funding models from um, libraries or readers to now authors. So those article processing charges. And so now you as authors are beginning to see some of the pricing and the profiteering that's going on. So anyway, that's just to, to give you a little bit of background why um, in some of the library resources, not just here, but in many of the different library links that I might show you later, don't tend to use the term predatory. Having said that, I will just because, I mean, that's that's the term that's out there, right? So anyway, I will continue using it, but just, just to give you a bit of background and sort of the, the nuance or context to the situation. And so the 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 conventional publishers don't generally um, try to deceive you. They're typically not trying to deceive you, right? They're not like the predatory publishers and they do provide those services that they claim to. So they're different in that way. It's just the pricing thing. Okay, so these predatory, these scam, these internet scams, I prefer to call them deceptive publishers. So you might see that term or um, some other terms like questionable or illegitimate or fake, you know, you might see those terms going around too. So that's all to refer to these, these entities that are just basically internet scams, right? Okay. So I should mention there's this other perspective too. Um, in some cases, there may be some authors that are complicit. Um, so not necessarily all authors are being fooled. They might you know, appreciate some of the services, services, I'll say that in quotation marks, that these um, deceptive or predatory journals provide, and that is speed, right? So I think the main um, thing that these things, that these entities provide is sort of, they try and ensure that they'll have fast peer review and peer review tends, if it's a good quality peer review, it's going to take some time, right? We know that. Um, and so that's a big red flag if there's a, a journal that's promising speed. And, you know, at some point, some authors may be desperate to get a paper out before some kind of deadline, like a tenure deadline or a promotion deadline, something like that. Maybe it's been rejected at a couple other places and they might want to take the risk. They might be very well aware that this particular journal is kind of questionable. Um, and so that's what I mean. There may be some of that going on too. And so that's how these, these entities sort of survive. You know, they mislead some authors and then some authors might, might be complicit too. Okay, so just more nuance but it is not worth the risk. I, I'm sure you realize that and that's why you're here today to learn how to avoid these things. But let me just reassure you that you do not want to get caught up in one of these journals um, because of course your reputation will be harmed and your reputation is one of the things you do not want harmed in academia. It's, it's one of your currencies as an academic, right? Your reputation. Once your name becomes affiliated with one of these questionable um, publishers and Everywhere you go from then on, we'll be looking at your CV and wondering what the reputation of that work is and what, you know, your reputation is as well, because you publish there. So for that reason, you want to avoid, but there's other reasons too. I mean, if you're, if you value the work that you've done, the, the research and the time you've put into your research and the resources and everything that have gone into producing this work, you don't want it to disappear. Um, so these predatory publishers are internet scams. They're up to make a buck. And if they want to close down, they could close down any day. Your paper that's posted with them on their website could disappear along with it. This has happened. So I've had researchers contact me that have been taken in by one of these entities and their paper has now gone missing because that entity's gone missing from the internet, right? So, um, it, yeah, that's another reason you don't want your work to to um, be with these groups because then it could disappear. It's always good um, practice to keep keep some copies, you know, keep your own copy and maybe post in a repository like we have Harvest here at the university, our institutional repository. You can always post 
a copy as long as you um, have the rights to do so. Okay, um, the other issue here, of course, these aren't reputable, legitimate publishers, so they're not indexed in all of the regular sources that other um, scholars, researchers will be looking at to find papers, right? So your work will be hard to find. It won't be discoverable by other people, other researchers in your field. Um, and, you know, sometimes this happens too. Um, the, the researcher gets sort of duped. They submit their article and then they realize afterwards that this was a questionable journal. Uh, they try to withdraw the paper and um, they're unable to. And, you know, this is this is a really difficult thing. Um, sometimes university lawyers have gotten involved. I'm, I'm speaking of other other institutions. I don't know an, an, an example here, but I'm, it might have happened. Anyway, so it's, you can imagine getting lawyers involved in that kind of thing. It becomes a big issue. So anyway, difficult to withdraw the paper and they still might hold it ransom for a fee, right? So all those things is um, why you want to avoid <laughs> Um, and here's here's a bit of nuance now too that I promised. There's um, I think this is going away a bit now, but there's always been since the beginning of the open access movement about 20 years ago this conflation of open access with predatory. So um, the availability of online journal software and and the internet itself and the open access funding models is what enables these predatory entities to exist, I guess. So all predatory journals are open access, but not all open access journals are predatory, of course, and they're not all low quality either. So uh, please don't conflate the two. Um, I think this is getting um, covered now. Like people aren't so much uh, having this opinion anymore. And that's because most well-known and reputable publishers nowadays have their own OA journals, right? So, you know, if these well-known reputable publishers have OA journals, not all OA journals are predatory or low quality, of course. And most journals don't even charge fees to authors. I mean, a lot of these big well-known ones do because they're profit-driven and they want to make, make money and they're well-known so they can do that. But most of the... Um, smaller scholar-led mission-driven kind of OA journals out there are what we call diamond journals. Uh, they don't charge fees to authors or readers. Um, so therefore that means that they're not predatory because they're not taking in any of your money, right? But you know they may be uh, considered low quality by some and we'll get into some of those conversations too. So finding a reputable OA journal, so maybe you do want to publish OA, but you want to avoid these predatory outlets. You can search the directory of open access journals. This is a great um, quality controlled list, like a trusted list, uh, I'll say. It relies on journal editors of these uh, reputable journals to submit an application. So, um, so this means that the editor has to go to the effort of going through the process. So that means that not all journals out there are in this directory. There's about, there's estimated to be around 30,000 um, Diamond OA journals out there. And so you can see here, there's about, this has actually gone up to around 19,000 now from when I took the screenshot. But anyway, about um, 12,000 or around 13,000 now are journals without these article processing charges for authors. So they're, they're diamond. So that's just to illustrate that there's lots of journals out there that don't charge any money at all. And so they're by definition, not predatory. Okay. Um, and let's get into the topic of quality. And again, I have those scare quotes because I think this is a topic of um, some discussion. Everybody might have a little bit of different idea what they consider quality, right? Um, quality of the journal or quality of the content within the journal, right? And so both conventional subscription journals and open access journals can range from high to low quality. So 
quality is irrespective of access model or funding model. I mean, there there's lots of instances of high impact journals that have you know made a lot of mistakes. So this this happens in all sorts of journals. Um, quality is also kind of subjective. That's why I have the scare quotes too. So legitimate journals can range anywhere on this spectrum from high to low quality. And I think the quality factor really depends on the people, the people that are associated with the journal and how well they uphold the journal's um, ethics and policies and that kind of thing. Um, if they're being sloppy or not tending to their job, I mean, this that means the quality can go down. And so it, I think that means it depends on the people in charge and those people um, change over time, of course. So that means the journal quality can change over time. So low quality doesn't necessarily equal predatory either, like we're kind of talking about, right? So there can be, so basically predatory journals are low quality by definition, but not all low quality journals are predatory, right? If that makes sense. So I think this is the hardest thing with this area that we talk about because low quality journals aren't there to deceive you or take your money necessarily. They're just maybe not doing such a great job. So that is, but they get conflated with these predatory things that are just scams. Um, so low quality, like I said, it's kind of subjective, and I think it could just in indicate lack of experience in the people involved in the um, the journal itself. And so that can be like some of these really small scholar-led journals that I mentioned earlier. They get unfairly labeled as predatory. So just something to keep in mind. Um, one of the, one of the things is that often these are journals from the global south or non-Western countries, so. Their first language may not be English, and so they're making some honest mistakes in grammar or spelling. So, and then people might label them predatory. So, anyway, there's just this distinction I want you to keep in mind. So, this can happen for a number of reasons. Like I said, the, the journals are generally under resourced, um, they're being run by volunteers, they're being run by scholars who are, you know, their expertise is in their subject matter, not necessarily in running a journal. And so they're making honest mistakes, um, not enforcing policies or not, you know, um, or just being sloppy, I guess, is what I've said. So I've already mentioned this English might not be their native language. So this is very different, of course, from predatory journals that are actively trying to deceive you. Um, so the... But the reality is um, many people will lump these low quality journals under the label predatory. And these people are often judging your work based on where it's published. So I'm thinking like if you're going for a job somewhere, a tenure track job, and you have to submit your CV, or maybe you're, you've already been hired and you're on the tenure track and you're going for tenure promotion or, you know, grants, people are always looking at your CV and looking where you've published. Not necessarily the quality of what you've published, unfortunately, is what I think it should be, but that's more difficult to assess. So with research assessment, we tend to use these proxies about where it's published, right? So um, that's the unfortunate reality. So you definitely don't want to risk your reputation by being associated with a predatory journal. We've established that. Um, but even though low quality journals are legitimate, you probably don't want to be associated with them either because people conflate these two all the time. So having gone through all of that uh, distinction between those two categories, you essentially don't want to be associated with either. You definitely don't want to be associated with a predatory journal, but you want to make some judgment about the what may be perceived to be a low quality journal, okay? So that's a lot of, of nuance. Now, let's get to the practical, because um, I think that's what you're all here for. And I, but I think that context really um, provides some basis for assessing the journals that you come across. And I think a few people might have arrived since I last put my slides link, so I'll add them one more time. And I'll pause here in case there's any questions at this point. Just watching the chat.
Okay, seeing none, I'll, I'll go on now. Um, so the main thing people always ask me is, show me the list, you know. I want a list of legitimate or illegitimate journals, you know, deceptive or predatory list or whatever. Um, so let's talk about lists, first of all. Generally, we tr say to try and avoid these sorts of predatory lists or what they used to be called a blacklist. You might still hear that term. So these are lists that people out there, you'll find them online, uh, lists of what people have considered to be predatory or deceptive journals or publishers, right? Um, and so the, the opposite to that is a trusted list, like a white list, and uh, this is what they used to be called. And the Directory of Open Access Journals is, um, is an example of one of these trusted lists. They, it is a legitimate list of journals, publishers that you can trust, basically, because they've undergone a criteria check by the directory itself. Okay, so the problems with relying on a list, like I mentioned with the DOAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, um, not all journals are on there, and that doesn't mean just because they're not on there that they're not reputable, right? It's a good sign if they're on there that they're reputable, but if they're not, then it's kind of a neutral indicator, I guess. The list can never be fully up to date or complete, basically, is, is the main problem with relying solely on a list. Um, public, and like we talked about with the, um, the quality, publications change ownership and leadership and editorial boards and all of that over time, and therefore a decrease or increase in this quality. So it's, it's not fair to exclude a journal forever, you know, put them on a, one of these predatory lists when really um, it's just a matter of quality because the leadership's poor and they may improve. And then they've been forever tainted by being included on this list. Um, yeah, and lists can easily exclude the, those emerging journals, those smaller journals that don't have a lot of resources to go through application processes or maybe don't have the expertise to even recognize that they need to be on these directories of um, uh, open access journals, for, for example. And finally, um, the predatory lists have been widely criticized for having biases against journals from the global south. Again, they're conflating the, the, the perceived quality with predatory. So they're making a judgment about um, um, mistakes in a language or something and labeling. And so that's, that's, again, unfair and damages the reputation of a journal that's just trying, trying their best, maybe. So you've probably heard of Beale's list. That's probably the most famous of these um, predatory lists. It's been discontinued for a number of years now, but you can probably still find copies online. They're really out of date. So um, not, not a good idea to really rely on those. I mean, if you find a title of a journal on that list, it may be worthwhile to really think and assess that journal carefully, but don't, don't use it as your only um, indicator, right? Um, Beale was quite a controversial individual. He was um, accused of being very biased um, for the reasons that I mentioned in the previous slide. He would um, label journals as predatory simply because of the country they originated from. Uh, and he had a clear bias against open access and that's documented. And so he, he has since retired. He was a librarian in Colorado. Uh, so that list has been discontinued. But there are others out there that people start up that are, you know, similar. But they have the same problems. Um, this Cabell's predatory report is a bit different because it's actually a company, a legitimate, reputable company that um, runs this thing. And it's, but it's a subscription product for that reason. Um, they've put a lot of energy and resources into trying to combat some of these biases and make a legitimate resource. Um, we don't subscribe because it's quite expensive and, you know, it's still an issue we have with these predatory lists. But just so you're aware that that does exist and you can surely find other predatory lists out there. But there are trusted lists too, like we already talked about DOAJ. Um, the Committee on Publication Ethics and the Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association are more membership organizations than trusted lists. But you do need to go through a qualification 
process to be become members. And so it's a good indicator if you find the, the journal or the publisher, I guess, on one of those membership lists, it's a good indicator that, you know, they've been assessed as a decent quality. Um, they're not predatory, right? So those are three um, places, the primary places I would check, those three trusted lists. And um, check with your particular department or with your colleagues. There may be disciplinary lists within your own discipline of journals that people consider reputable. Um, I know certain, I know, I think business, uh, it's very common for, with business colleges to have these kinds of lists. So that's another way too. Okay, so let's get into the actual um, criteria for assessing journals. Pause in case there's any questions at this point. I don't see any. Okay. So <laughs> this is the big obvious one that everybody seems to talk about first is the, those crazy unsolicited emails. I just don't even look at them really anymore. Those unsolicited emails, just ignore them <laughs> is, the, is the general rule of thumb here especially if they're overly flattering. I mean, don't get taken in by that, but they often get your discipline way wrong too. I mean, they think I'm obstetrician sometimes and that's way wrong. <laughs> uh, so it's it's pretty obvious. It's almost not even worth mentioning. That's a red, red flag, of course. That's not to say that all emails um, from journals or publishers are illegitimate. Um, Often journals will have, you know, special issues or that kind of thing, and they need to let people know about them. And so, especially if you're on like a mailing list of particular journals, so you'll receive those things. So if you do receive um, an email from an entity you don't recognize, definitely check out the official website and go through all of the criteria that we're going to discuss now. Submit through the proper channels, etc. Not not just um, through the links on that particular email. Okay, so I think transparency is one of the biggest, biggest criteria. So there's that big red flag that we already mentioned. If they promise a quick turnaround time for peer review, like that's the big um, uh, thing that, that pulls people in because they have deadlines they want to meet and they want to get their paper out there by one of those deadlines. So that is a really big red flag because peer review, you can't really ever promise um, a, a particular date that it will be done by. They might hope that it will be done by a certain date, and but it's really hard to, to ensure or guarantee that. Um, so that's a big red flag. But other than that, Reputable journals, um, especially if they're well managed and run by professionals, will have their policies clearly stated on their website. If you can't find their policies on submission, peer review, and acceptance, author fees, big one, author fees should be very, very clear. There should be nothing hidden, and you shouldn't have to ask what the fees are. Copyright policies. That should be very clear as well and listed on the website. Uh, these are all um, Committee on Publishing Ethics recommendations for ethical publishing, these sorts of things. So that's not to say that all legitimate journals have these things, because like I said, a lot of legitimate journals, I mean, they're simply not run by professionals, so they're not necessarily up to all the right standards. So, you know, keep that in mind. Okay, another big, big red flag is the metrics. Um, so predatory journals, again, they try to deceive you, right? So they're creating false or fake metrics that mimic like a real metric name. So I think probably most of you have heard of the journal impact factor. This is a legitimate journal metric that has been and is used to rank journals, basically by citations. It's calculated by a specific entity called Clarivate, which is which produces Web of Science, which is a literature database you've probably heard of. So um, any journal that's included, indexed in Web of Science will get um, an impact factor. And that will be listed in journal citation reports. So I have this link here if you do want to ever check. So if you find a um, a journal that you think might be predatory or deceptive saying it has an impact factor, 
you can go to journal citation report to look it up and see verify if they do this is a subscription product again but since you're affiliated with the university you'll be able to access because we have subscribed if if you leave the university and you're um, in between jobs or whatever um, the master list master journal list for web of sciences is freely accessible this just shows you what what journals web of science indexes and so therefore get a citation or a impact factor assigned okay so that's another link so there are un unethical companies out there that will sell fake metrics to to also fake companies right so here are some examples uh, you might come across these ones uh, you'll notice that they are trying to sound like or similar to that journal impact factor which is the the legitimate one we just talked about so global impact factors, scholarly article impact factor. So they're trying to kind of deceive you um, into thinking that it's the other legitimate one, right? So that's a big red flag. Indexing. So this is another thing you'll probably see, um, claims about where the journal is indexed. So in major literature databases like, like Web of Science, like I just mentioned, so you could go to Web of Science, that um, master journalist, link and verify if they are so included there um yeah so this is often the case too they'll often index or say that they're indexed in places like reddit or you know google scholar these aren't scholarly these aren't indexes right um google scholar tries um to um, list i guess it's not really an index but they they try to list results that are scholarly but um, they don't necessarily um, do a quality check of course and it's not an index so if a if a journal is saying they're indexed in google scholar well it, yeah everything is you know so that's not really a, a good indicator <laughs> it's not an indicator of anything uh okay and so like we said before, um, if you do get caught up in one of these predatory journals, they aren't typically indexed, so your paper won't be discoverable by readers. So that's the reason you want to avoid them too. Okay, so the people associated with the journal. Um, editorial board, are these actual people that you recognize? Are what What is their expertise in being listed there? do they even know they're listed so i have that in italics there because it's it, it has been the case that really well-known people in a field are chosen to be put on editorial boards of these fake journals um just to give them some sort of prestige or something some indicating indicator of quality because they have this really well-known researcher in that area but that person doesn't even know that they're on listed on that website so um, if editorial board members are invented, if they're obviously not a real person, if you know there's a stock photo of a person, that's obviously you've seen it on other stock photo websites. Um, that's a bad, bad, a big red flag. And if they're listed without their knowledge. So if you are familiar with any of these people that are listed, you might want to reach out to them and say, are you in fact an editor or an editorial board member? And they might say, yes or no so relatedly um, it's good for you to google yourself periodically too to make sure you haven't been unknowingly put on listed as one of these board members too so i see a question about predatory conferences so i have a slide on that later so we'll we'll talk about that michelle okay uh another criteria is journal name so logos designs so the recognition factor so are you familiar with this journal already or are your colleagues familiar already is the name and website design too similar to one of these well-known titles so again they try and deceive you by mimicking known journals that have a reputation already so they maybe make a, a name that's very very similar to a journal title that is reputable so there's a blog post that talks about this by that Clarivate that runs Web of Science, like I said. So you might want to have a look there and see an example on that on that blog post. 
So this is called journal hijacking. They're trying to um, deceive authors that are going to the legitimate journal and, and mistakenly go to this other one instead. This can also happen, I've heard of this happening when journals, sometimes reputable journals, legitimate journals, just cease publishing sometimes. They just close shop, right? Maybe you didn't hear that this happened to your favorite journal, and then this scam entity will try and take over its um, its name, its image, so website URL, all that stuff, logo design, it will try and imitate that journal and start up publishing again. So beware that that occasionally happens too. Okay, content, I think this is the most, maybe one of the most obvious things next to those unsolicited emails. It's like, if you have a question about a particular journal, whether it's reputable or good quality or not, have a look at the articles they've already published. Are they any good? I mean, it'll be pretty obvious pretty soon um, that they have been edited or not, right? That they've gone through some um, copy editing, for example. Also, um, journals, that's one of the main things journals will have on their website is their scope. So you, as an author, when you want to submit to a journal, you want to see, is your article topic within the scope of this journal? So they need to have a well-defined scope, um, leaving aside some of those mega journals like PLOS One that are just everything. But most other journals will have a scope, right? And so look at those articles that have already been published in that journal. Are they within the scope of that journal? So do they align? And that's one of the key giveaways because a predatory journal will just take whatever is submitted, right? Whether or not it aligns with whatever they've said that their scope is. So um, any poor quality, obviously poor quality, no copy editing, and, and anything that's beyond the stated scope, avoid that journal. Website language, so we've talked a bit about this already. So the accuracy of the information posted, if there's a lot of typos and grammar, grammar errors, I mean, I hesitate here because again, we're getting back to the fact that there may be somebody making honest mistakes that doesn't have English as a first language. So I wanna keep that in mind, but 10 legitimate journals do make mistakes, but they tend not to be as frequent or as obvious, okay? So, it's a bit of a sliding scale there and a bit of a gray area, I think, this this particular one. So I wouldn't disqualify journals just on this factor, but if there's a lot of obvious mistakes, I mean, they're being sloppy and maybe you don't want to be associated with that journal, even if it's not exactly predatory, right? Okay, website quality. Again, there's some that just look really amateur and unprofessional. Maybe you don't want your work on such a site. So we're getting into areas that are a bit more difficult to judge, like community is kind of a bit more amorphous to judge. But think about like where this journal came from. Most predatory journals are just out there and they don't seem to be affiliated with any kind of group, like a scholarly association, a university. Um, so the relationship between that journal and some kind of community around it should should be somewhat verifiable and the publisher itself and the contact information provided should be clear um, so that's another issue that happens with the, the scam journals they often have sort of um, oblique kind of contact information that doesn't seem really professional like a gmail or a hotmail email address for example Okay, so here's a summary. So we're getting to the summary part here. Um, the big, big red flags, if you come across any of these, just avoid. So those spam emails with really obvious errors and that are overly flattering, delete. Just don't even, don't even consider. Promises of super fast turnaround time for peer review, big red flag false claims of indexing or metrics. I mean, they're trying to mislead you. You don't want to be associated with them. Again, fake editorial board members. If they're making up things and they're trying to mislead you, that's a scam, right? And this this last one, I think, is, is probably the best thing that you can do is just read some of the articles. If they're low quality and outside the stated scope, that's a huge red flag, too. They're obviously just taking anything that's submitted to them and taking the fees from the authors.
Okay. I say smaller red flags here because these can often be found in legitimate low quality journals like we've discussed. So it's, you know, the typos and errors. So it's kind of that sliding scale. If you see lots of obvious typos and lots of errors, they're kind of being sloppy. Maybe you don't want to be associated with them. And the clarity in journal policies and processes. You definitely want them to be clear about your author's fees. You don't want to be surprised by these author's fees. They need to be clear and upfront and transparent about all of these policies. But I do know legitimate journals that, you know, are not so clear on these things. And that's not to their benefit. They should they should up their, up their procedures and they'll look a lot better if they do. So anyway, these are kind of the iffy ones, I would say, maybe. So I have a bunch of links here um, to various other criteria checklists. So the main one that we usually recommend is this Think, Check, Submit. It's um, widely endorsed by many industry representatives um, initiatives. Like they've collaborated to create this, this list to, to walk you through this, this criteria checking process. And then closer to home, U of T Library has a really nice handout, two-pager, and CARL, which is the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, has a nice little one-page guide. So they cover a lot of the same sort of criteria that we've just discussed. Uh, this journal evaluation tool is like a rubric. It's actually quite intense. Uh, it's pretty nice uh, piece of work. It's if you want to do, maybe you want to work with your students through an example, like that would be a good a good tool to use for that kind of thing. Um, the Open Access Scholarly Publishers Association that we mentioned earlier, it's a nice thing if um, uh, you see the publisher that you're questioning on that list because that means that they're adhering to some best standards in publishing. And so OASPA and some others have put together this, these principles and the principles are things can be used as a criteria checklist essentially. Um, so you can work through those those principles to see if the journal you're questioning um, can you know complies with those sorts of principles. And so I've listed um, all of these things on a on a guide on an online guide. Um, I mentioned this earlier when we talked about the definition. So you can always go to this guide, and some of these resources are posted there. Most of them, I think. Uh, and also some further reading if you're interested just in reading some articles about this this whole area. And I think like your librarian, there's librarians um, like myself assigned to every subject taught here at the university. So seek out your librarian. This is a hyperlinked list here of librarians at the university. And you can find a librarian who knows your discipline the best and can probably support you if you have a question about a particular title. They can help help you work through the criteria and give you a second opinion, for example. Okay, so some related topics. Somebody asked about um, predatory conferences. So, so there's predatory journals, so of course there's predatory conferences. Um, these are, like you can imagine, fake conferences trying to masquerade as real conferences simply to collect your conference fee. I mean, if there's a way to scam people, somebody will invent it, right? Um, so yeah, they try and imitate other known conferences similar to the hijacked journal that we talked about. So using um, similar names or logos, trying to deceive you. Again, it's that uh, deception element. However, like we said, sometimes researchers can be complicit. So um, these conferences may be in some really nice destination locations, Hawaii or somewhere, or Bangkok. Um, so you wonder sometimes maybe maybe researchers are kind of uh, submitting there for a vacation. I hope that wouldn't happen, but I think maybe it does sometimes. So that might be another um, reason that some some of these conferences exist, right? So here's a, a common example you might come across. Uh, I just went and checked and they're still up. This their website and they have a whole bunch of conferences going on. And so just like that think, check, submit um, resource I just mentioned, there's a, a similar resource to assess conferences. So it's it's a lot of kind of the similar criteria as for journals that we went through. Um, so you can go to this this link and you know go through some of these these checklist criteria 
to assess the, the conference you might be interested in. Okay, uh, what's next? Oh, so this other related related topic is these SciComm, science communication businesses. So this has come up sort of every, every few months I get asked about something like this. So it's kind of a new business model um, that people aren't familiar with. And so when there's something unfamiliar and it's a business that's, you know, asking for a fee, people are understandably um, skeptical and that's a good thing. Um, so they they do assume it's predatory, but it, not necessarily, right? So this is just, um, these are businesses that basically offer to write up a plain language summary of your of your research, or maybe even podcasts. They do podcasts too, sometimes, or videos. Uh, and it's meant to be kind of a PR um, thing, because when you're a researcher and so um, into your topic and in the, into the technical language it's sometimes hard to write plain language summaries right so that's a definite skill and a business model a legitimate business model but it's a business so they charge a fee and sometimes big fees so um, be cautious because every legitimate um, business can range from high to low quality, like we talked about with journals, even legitimate journals range from high to low quality. So you still want to maybe assess um, the quality of the product. So look at one's uh, articles they've already done. They're almost always freely available. They're not subscription things. And because they're meant for researchers to put out there as sort of almost PR for, for their research groups, okay? So use similar criteria that we talked about for journals. Uh, transparency is probably key. So I've seen really high quality um, services like this, and I've seen some low quality ones. Low quality ones do not have any transparency of the pricing, and you're kind of surprised by these high high fees, and it's not clear what you get. So it should be clear what you're getting for that fee too. Uh, because it is a, a kind of an unfamiliar new model, you want to know exactly what you're getting. Um, what's the quality? Like I said, so go and have a look at some of these articles or listen to the podcasts. Reputation, um, ask around if anybody's heard of them, uh, if they've had a good experience or not, you know, contact some of the, some of the, um, researchers that have used their services. So that's something I've done. I've reached out to some of these researchers just to ask them about them and some have been good experiences. So, uh, and I think it matters, uh, the staff that are involved. I know some of the high quality ones that I've interacted with, they have staff who are actually, um, who have post-secondary degrees, uh, who have grad school degrees even. And, you know, there's lots of graduate students who don't go on in academia, but they still have their grad school degrees that they may qualify um, as technical writers or writers or what am I talking about? Like journalists, journalists uh, that have good skills that way to write in plain language. So anyway, qualifications of the staff. So those are two sort of related areas. Um, so in summary, I'm going to give you a bit of advice and then we have some time for maybe discussion or questions. So I think you need to assess all unfamiliar journals. Uh, you don't want to be associated with a predatory journal and you probably don't want to be associated with any low quality journal, even though they're not predatory. Other people that are assessing your work will be often assessing it on where you've published and they may assume that that low quality title is predatory. So, you know, it may not be fair to these um, low resourced journals, but it, you need to think about your reputation, I think. Okay, that's just, that's my opinion, but you need to um, sort of assess based on where you are in your career, I think. Okay, so uh, don't rely solely on the predatory lists, like I said, but you should definitely check those trusted lists like the Directory of Open Access Journals. That's a really good indicator. Any discipline specific ones that your colleagues might mention or your unit head might mention. Uh, and then membership in some of those uh, publishing associations like OAS, OASPA, I call it, Open Access Scholarly Publishing Association, COPE, a Committee on Publishing Ethics. Those are good places to look to see if the publisher of interest is a member, and that's a good indicator. 
do your own assessments based on all the different criteria we've done here. So if something appears on a list, take that into account and then go and also do your own assessment. Uh, I mean, you've you spent all this time on your research, right? And you want to make sure this one final step is done right and it's posted, put somewhere, published somewhere that's um, reputable and doesn't harm your reputation. So experienced colleagues in your field, if you're an early career researcher, um, this may be a challenging um, topic for you to assess all these journals. It may help to consult with somebody that's more experienced, that has some more familiarity with some of these titles. And your librarian, of course, like I mentioned. Um, they'll have lots of subject-specific knowledge too, can help you. So I did want to mention that we have one more um, session in this series that we're having this week, and that's tomorrow. So I have the link here in case you're interested in learning more about our institutional repository. Uh, that's where you can post uh, some of your research output, not just articles, but other things too. Uh, and that's free, a free service to make your, your research open access. Okay, so I'll stop there. Um, see if there's any questions.